We want to welcome you this evening to our Bible class at Ephesus Church of Christ. It's always good to be able to come together and to study the Word together. And uh, even though we're doing it over the internet, it's still a togetherness. We'll be studying the book of Hebrews. If you want to get your Bibles out and, and find your place there, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 6 this evening. Uh, we will begin with a, a prayer and then we'll have a song and then we will begin our Bible lesson. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, God, just thank you so much for today and for this wonderful uh, opportunity we have to study your word together. We thank you for your love and thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. Help us as we study your word to have an open mind, open heart, and to be willing to live for you and serve you. Give us wisdom to understand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sending on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. It's good to be back. And as we begin our study this evening, as I mentioned already, we'll be in the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 6. Uh, the Hebrew writer uh, has been telling us uh, the greatness of Jesus Christ and telling us who Jesus is. And, and so we have seen that he is superior to the prophets. He's superior to the angels. He is superior to Moses. Uh, and he is a high priest, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We saw back in chapter 4, we saw in chapter 5 uh, the uh, mention of Melchizedek. And chapter 5 ends uh, as he's talking about Melchizedek. And he says, for all the, although by this time, he said, I wish I could tell you more about Melchizedek, but it's hard to explain. And then verse 12, for by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you come to need milk, not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And so then as he goes into chapter 6, he begins by saying, therefore, uh, and that is based on what I just told you. Uh, you are dull of hearing. Uh, he says you ought to be teachers. You're dull of hearing. Uh, you need milk only instead of uh, solid food. And so he's, he has said that this is a problem. And we talked a little bit last week about uh, some of the, the reasons why this might be, and even today, why some people may be dull of hearing. And so he says, 
really you need to be teachers by this time. So therefore, he says, we're going to leave the elementary teaching about the Christ and let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. And so in these first three verses, uh, he is telling us that we're going to leave these things and we're going to move on. Now, he's not saying that these are not important. He's not saying that these things don't matter. He's not saying we're going to reject them. But what he is saying is that we're going to move on. We're going to move forward past these things. It's sort of like when you begin learning to read, you learn your alphabet, you learn the sounds of the letters, uh, and then you learn to put some of the letters together to make words, and then you begin to put words together to make sentences. Uh, the same thing is true in math. You start out with addition and subtraction, you go to multiplication and division, and then you move on to higher math. And you use all of this to move forward. It's a, a maturing process, it's a growing process. And so he is saying that we need to grow, we need to mature. And so he says we're going to leave these elementary teachings about the Christ that is the very basics. He says let us press on to maturity. Uh, and maturity comes, as we just saw in the previous chapter, chapter 5, by, by partaking of solid food. And so he says not laying again, and he divides these into three different pairs, not laying in the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. We begin our walk with Christ based on faith. We begin as we turn and repent of our past and our sins, and we turn away from them and we turn to God. And so these go together, this faith and repentance, and, and there's other passages that pair these two together. And this is the very basic foundation of our serving Christ, of washings, he says. Instructions about washings and laying on of hands. It seems that probably here he's talking about baptism. Uh, it's the washings and the laying on of hands probably had to do with the early church that uh, practiced miracles and they had the laying on of the hands to impart the Holy Spirit on those that became Christians. And then he says of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And, and the fact is, when we're trying to convince somebody to be a Christian, we talk to them about faith in Jesus Christ. We talk to them about turning away from their sins. We talk to them uh, about the fact that they need to be baptized into Christ. And we talk to them about the fact that if they don't do that, then there is going to be a judgment and there is going to be eternal judgment. And so uh, there is a resurrection and there is going to be eternal judgment. And so these are all basics about becoming a Christian. These are all basics about becoming a child of God. And he says, we need to move on past these things. We need to not reject them, but we need to based on these things. And we grow based on them and we move on forward. And he says, we're going to do this if God permits. And so tonight we will move forward and move past these things. In verse 4 beginning, he says, In the case of those who have once been enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good work, word of God and the powers of the ages to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified of themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now, again, as we have seen already a couple of times previously, the Hebrew writer very definitely is teaching that it is possible for someone who is a Christian, someone who is a child of God, to fall away and to be lost. And, and that's, that is what the Bible teaches, even though there are many people that don't hold to that and don't believe that. That is, in fact, what the Bible is teaching. He says, in the case of those who have been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift, that is, those who have become Christians, we looked at the basics of how to become a Christian, and now he says, okay, for those who have become a Christian, those who are children of God, those who are in Jesus Christ, they have been enlightened. They have realized what it means to serve God. They realize what it means to be in Jesus Christ. They have tasted the heavenly gift and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. And so, as is promised to those who are Christians, 
the Holy Spirit is given to us and we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And he says, if we have done that and we have tasted the good word of God, that is, we have benefited from it, we have feasted upon it, and, and we have seen the powers of the ages to come, and, and probably the age to come refers to the Christian age. In the Hebrew mind, that's what it would have been as this was written. And so it probably refers simply to the Christian age, not some future time for us. But he says they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. This book is written to help these Christians not fall away. Uh, that, was, that was a real danger for them uh, because of the persecutions, because of other problems. And they come from a Jewish background, and, and so they are constantly being pulled away from Christianity to go back to Judaism. And he has shown that the way of Christ is far superior, and he will continue to do that in the next several chapters. And he says that it is, it is possible for these people to fall away. And he says it is impossible, once this happens, that is, they have fallen away, to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. I do not believe that the Hebrew writer is saying here that once a person is a Christian and he becomes unfaithful, he falls away, that it is impossible under any circumstances for that person to ever come back to Christ. What I believe he is saying here is that as long as a person maintains that attitude of not having faith in Jesus Christ and maintains that attitude of not serving Christ, that is, it is impossible for them to be renewed. In fact, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning verse 24, he says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And so he says God can, in fact, grant them repentance, and, and he can forgive them if they are willing to change their mind, if they're willing to change their heart. And then he says, let me give you an analogy. Let me tell you, this is like ground that drinks the rain, verse 7. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. For if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. And so he says here that it, it's like when rain falls on the ground, what's going to grow? Well, if it's good crops that are growing, then it's tilled and, and it's useful. But if all that will grow on it is just thorns and, and thistles and, and things like that, then it's worthless. And so he says, that's just going to be burned up. Well, I think the analogy here is obvious that if, if we're going to grow and we're going to be useful to the Lord, then we can, in fact, uh, have, have this promise of eternal life. But for the one who falls away, ends up being burned. Uh, and that's true for the unfaithful as well. Uh, Peter talks about this over in 1 Peter chapter 1 when he talks about the Christian graces. Uh, and he talks about the fact that we must uh, continue to grow in these things. And he says if we don't grow in them, then we become useless and unfruitful. And so we, need, we must continue to be growing in Jesus Christ and growing in these Christian graces that he mentions there in 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 9, he says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking to you in this way. He's been pretty harsh uh, in these verses up until now. But he says, yes, it's possible to fall away, but I, I don't believe you're going to. He says, I believe that you're going to be faithful. You're going to stick it out. And so he says, we are convinced of better things. And he refers to them as beloved, that is, those that we love. And he says, I am convinced of better things. In other words, nobody has to be lost. It's a choice that we make. It's a choice that people can, can choose to not serve Jesus Christ and be lost. 
But God has provided salvation, made it available for everybody. Uh, Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so he says, everybody can have this salvation uh, and, and we don't have to choose to be lost, but rather we can choose to be saved. He goes on, he says in verse 10, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. You remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, and also in Mark 9 and verse 41, Jesus said that if we just give a cup of cold water in his name, that we won't lose our reward. Jesus tells us as well as Paul to lay up treasures in heaven. And Jesus says there moth and rust not uh, destroy or corrupt. And, and, and it's going to be there for us. And so God doesn't forget what we've done. And we are to minister to the saints. And he says it's an ongoing process. Notice he says in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And so we continue to help each other and we serve God and we serve Jesus Christ when we serve each other. And we all should have this servant attitude that Jesus demonstrates. Verse 11, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 5 through 8 and talking about those Christian graces. He says there that we are to give diligence to put into practice those things. And there's several times that we're encouraged to give diligence. And so he says, show the same diligence to realize the full assurance of hope until the end we don't have to be lost but we can be diligent in serving jesus christ all the way to the end and he says give this diligence so that you will not be sluggish and it's interesting that the word sluggish here is translated from the same original word that's found back in chapter 5 when he says you're dull of hearing the word is translated dull in chapter 5 it's translated as sluggish here and so it gives you an idea of what he's talking about. He says, don't be sluggish, but rather be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We need mentors. We need people that we can look up to. Uh, and, and there are so many faithful people around us that we can look up to and we can imitate their actions in serving Christ. It's like Paul said, Follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. And certainly, we don't just blindly follow somebody. We, we check what they're doing and saying by the Word of God. But at the same time, it is helpful to each of us and it is encouraging to each of us to be able to look to someone that is living for God, that is serving Jesus Christ faithfully, and we can see in them how we are to live for Jesus Christ. And there have been a lot of people through the years that have been such an encouragement to me as I have watched their lives. And, and I appreciate that and I give thanks to God for them. At the same time, we need to become mentors. And as we mature spiritually, and that's what he's been talking about up until now, is we are to grow spiritually, we are to mature. And as we become mature spiritually, we become mentors for others. We never know when somebody's watching us. It's it's uh, sometimes surprising uh, who is watching and how much they're watching and how much they will imitate us. Uh, and, and I've seen it happen with me. I've seen it happen with other people. And so we need to, to make sure that we are setting the right example for others. He says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he was, could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves and with an oath given as confirmation as an end to every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable, uh, I'm sorry, let me find my place here. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. 
he's saying here that God had a purpose. And He made His promises to Abraham and He's not going to change His purpose. He's not going to change His mind about these things. And so He says to make sure that God, that Abraham understood that and the heirs of Abraham understood that, He did it in two ways so that they would know that He meant what He said. First of all, it is impossible for God to lie and the very fact that He said it makes it sure. The second thing is, and this is, this is the way men look at it, and, and when someone takes an oath, and that, that is an assurance that what they're saying is true, it's going to really be fulfilled. And so he says God swore by himself, since there's no one greater than God, so he took an oath, and so we have two unchangeable things about God to show that surely he's going to bless Abraham and his descendants. And of course, that ultimate blessing is through Jesus Christ for us today. And he says, because of this, we can take hold of the hope that is set before us and we can do it with strong encouragement. We can be strongly encouraged by this hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is fully expecting something to take place. And so when we read about the promises that God makes, we can rest in hope on these things. And of course, the promises that he's talking about now are those that are found in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And so he says in verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so he says, we have this anchor. This anchor is, is, is solid. Uh, you ain't got to worry about this anchor drifting. It's going to be there. And he says we have this hope as an anchor of the soul. And so we can rest on the promises of God. We can rest in Jesus Christ and know that everything is going to be just exactly as he said. This anchor of the soul then is our faith in Jesus who is in heaven for us. He is our high priest and he has already ascended to the Father. He has offered himself as that sacrifice and taken that sacrifice to God on our behalf. And so we have this anchor of the soul in Jesus Christ where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. He's opened the door so that we may follow him. And he is now a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He mentioned Melchizedek in chapter 5. Uh, he mentioned Melchizedek again here in chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, next week, the Lord willing, we will actually get into a discussion of Melchizedek. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in God, we just thank you so much for this time we've had together to study your word. And we pray that your word will lift us up and give us hope and give us encouragement and Help us to put our faith in you and help us to be a good example for those around us. We ask you to help each of us have a servant spirit, a servant attitude that we might serve others as we serve you. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders that you will be with them and give them wisdom. We pray, Lord, that we can live in peace and we can have this, continue to have this freedom to worship you and to study your word. We pray that you will put a stop to the virus and the COVID-19 that is ravaging our country and we pray that when your time is ready and we know that you have the power to do so we pray that you'll put a stop to it forgive us when we sin we pray in Jesus name amen we want to thank you again for joining us this evening I encourage you to join us again next Wednesday evening as we continue in our study in the book of Hebrews on Sunday morning uh, at, we will have a service, a live service at 10 o'clock and another one at 11 o'clock. Uh, and if you cannot attend, we would certainly encourage you to join us in that service. Thank you and God bless you.